If we can have Dr. Harrison uh, come up to introduce the uh, smallpox vaccine uh, session. Thank you, John, and thanks for hanging into the uh, bitter end here. So I wanted to give you an update on where we are with the smallpox vaccine uh, work group. Um, and just to give you a little bit of a background, there have been numerous occurrences, which uh, Brett Peterson will be talking about, of laboratory-acquired orthopox uh, virus infections. Uh, and smallpox <coughs> vaccine pr uh, cross protects against all orthopox viruses. Uh, and smallpox vaccine is used to protect clinical and research laboratory workers against these viruses. And this is, these are slides that I showed last year, basically showing you some of these uh, laboratory uh, transmissions of, uh, of mostly vaccinia virus. Uh, this is a uh, auto inoculation um, here. And this is a, a needle stick. Mm. And then this is another uh, uh, transmission from uh, a laboratory strain uh, showing the, basically the eye, the pustule on the nose and the uh, ear. So, uh, so further background, ACIP recommendations uh, for smallpox vaccine were uh, uh, initiated and published in 2001. And then there was a supplement uh, in 2003. Uh, and since then, there's been a new smallpox uh, vaccine, ACAM 2000, which you're gonna hear quite a bit about from Brett, uh, which has been replaced uh, by uh, Drivax, which is no longer with us. So the work group was established uh, last year. We've had uh, monthly meetings uh, since uh, that time. Uh, this is uh, the uh, work group. Uh, Nana Bennett has mysteriously appeared on the list since I last saw the slides, and all available evidence suggests she is not currently on the work group, although we would be welcome her to the work group. <laughs> uh, uh, Brett uh, is our uh, DFO using the revised terminology and has really done a great job of uh, driving and uh, directing uh, the work group and keeping us uh, in line. And we have a very robust group of members who really uh, add a substantial amount of expertise as we talk about the various uh, issues related to uh, vaccine strains as well as uh, the vaccines. So the idea is to review recommendations uh, uh, that I mentioned that were uh, uh, issued in 2001 and then in 2003, review the uh, current uh, BMVL requirements for working with orthopox viruses, uh, and then Brett actually is going to show you, I showed you some pictures, but he's going to show you a, a fairly uh, uh, long list of, uh, of case reports of laboratory uh, transmissions. Uh, and we're also going to spend most of the day today talking about ACAMP 2000. This is a derivative of uh, Drivax, essentially, but it's uh, manufactured under uh, good laboratory practices. Uh, and we'll also be reviewing um, uh, publications on the uh, pre-event uh, program of 2002 to 2004 that you're all aware of. Uh, and then there is another vaccine that is not licensed. It's in the uh, national, uh, strategic national stockpile, Invimmune. This is basically informational, but the, uh, the interest in this vaccine is that it's uh, made from, as you can imagine from the name, MVA, uh, does not replicate in mammalian cells, so uh, has, would have a different safety profile. Uh, so we're going to be reviewing those data. But again, that's informational because of the licensure status of this vaccine. Uh, and then we're going to look at... Um, the recombinant uh, viruses that are in development are basically uh, being used uh, in laboratory workers. And this is interesting because there are uh, uh, varying degrees of attenuation and it's sometimes difficult to sort out the risk from individual uh, strains. Uh, and then the real bottom line is we want to take all of these statements and uh, the existing statement and the supplements uh, and create a single uh, policy note. So thank you. Okay, good morning. And I'll start by thanking Dr. Harrison for that introduction. And really the goal of my presentation today is to provide a general overview of some of the topics and issues that our working group has discussed to date. 
um, as well as some of the data that we have reviewed and assessed. And we really hope that this information can serve as a foundation for revising and updating the smallpox vaccine recommendations for laboratory workers. To start with a little bit of background, uh, orthopox viruses are a group of large double-stranded DNA viruses within the pox, pox viridae family. Uh, there are four known species that infect humans, those being variola or smallpox, vaccinia or smallpox vaccine, monkeypox, and cowpox. Orthopox virus infections provide cross protection across species, as mentioned by Dr. Harrison, and it's really this property that has uh, allowed the development of vaccinia as a vaccine for smallpox and other orthopox viruses, and ultimately uh, resulted in the eradication of smallpox uh, as a human disease. However, today, orthopox viruses remain an active subject of research. In particular, uh, vaccine, vaccinia virus is commonly used in laboratory research. Uh, there are many historic vaccine seed stocks and derivatives, of which a number are listed here. And different vaccinia viruses do demonstrate varying degrees of attenuation and safety profiles. Uh, recombinant vaccinia viruses are now being used increasingly in the laboratory uh, as a viral vector for expression of foreign genes uh, using gene therapy and genetic engineering. And they're also under investigation as potential recombinant vaccines and either, even as oncolytic and immunotherapies for cancer. Given the risks to laboratory workers using these viruses, the ACIP did produce uh, recommendations uh, for Vaccinia vaccine in 2001. Uh, the ACIP recommended Vaccinia vaccine for laboratory workers who directly handle either cultures or animals contaminated or infected with non-highly attenuated Vaccinia virus, recombinant Vaccinia viruses derived from non-highly attenuated Vaccinia strains, or other orthopox viruses that infect humans. They also recommended that vaccination can be offered to healthcare workers with direct contact with dress dressings or other infectious material from volunteers in clinical studies where non-highly attenuated vaccine viruses or recombinant viruses derived from these strains are used. In terms of revaccination, ACIP recommended that persons working with vaccinia virus, recombinant vaccinia viruses, or other non-variola orthopox viruses should be revaccinated at least every 10 years, and that revaccination every three years can be considered for persons working with more virulent non-variola orthopox viruses, uh, with monkeypox being the primary example. ACIP further recommended that laboratory and healthcare personnel working with highly attenuated pox virus strains do not require routine vaccinia vaccination. A list of the highly attenuated vox, pox virus strains is listed here. Now, when developing recommendations, it's clearly important to consider both the population at risk as well as the risk itself. And uh, both of these are, present challenges when considering smallpox vaccination for laboratory workers. The population at risk is uh, difficult to estimate. Uh, there's no registry of persons who work with orthopox viruses. And, but there are some indirect measures that I think can give some sense of the size of this population. So a simple PubMed search revealed that 431 orthopox-related publications were released in 2013. Uh, a, a search of the NIH research portfolio online revealed that there is 185 active projects listed uh, relating to vaccinia virus work. Um, clinicaltrials.gov lists 25 open clinical trials involving vaccinia virus. And lastly, we do know that vaccination of laboratory workers continues as last year in 2013, there were 31 different sites that received 80 shipments of smallpox vaccine from the CDC stockpile. Over the last five years, there's been 96 different sites uh, receiving 523 shipments. With respect to the uh, risk for orthopox viral disease from working with these viruses, um, there, it is a little bit difficult to estimate uh, the risk as well. Um, surveillance is not ideal and the tr true burden of disease is not known. 
Vaccine and cowpox infections are not reportable conditions, so we don't have a complete um, comprehensive list of all potential infections. Uh, similarly, orthopox virus exposures are not always rep reported, and particularly when no infection results, th this is a more likely situation. And lastly, the pathogenicity and virulence of the virus may not be well characterized, and that's particularly true with uh, recombinant viruses as uh, illustrated and highlighted by Dr. Harrison. However, the CDC has maintained a database of laboratory-related orthopox virus exposures and infections uh, that have been reported since 2004. And these are summarized in the tables in the following two slides. This next slide summarizes uh, some of these uh, cases. So 26 exposure incidents were reported, of which 69% involved recombinant viruses. Of these 26 exposures, 54% actually resulted in infections. 86% uh, of the infections involved recombinant viruses. The viruses involved in the infections uh, were primarily vaccinia, representing 86% of the infections, although two cowpox infections were also reported, representing 14% of the infections. Of note, four of the 14 infections actually required hospitalization, so that's 29% of total infections. And also of note, uh, another 25% of the infections, uh, it was actually found that the strain uh, infecting was uh, a strain other than that which the researcher thought they were working with which shows that some of the uncertainty in um, these, uh, the risk of these laboratory workers. Uh, lastly, uh, seven of the 26 uh, exposure incidents um, involved laboratory workers who met the ACIP vaccination recommendations. And of these, only one resulted in infection. There was one other infection that occurred in an individual who was vaccinated beyond 10 years prior and so was not um, meeting the ACIP vaccination recommendations. To switch gears just a little bit, we'll start by giving an overview of the smallpox vaccine. Uh, ACAM 2000 is currently the only sm smallpox vaccine licensed and available in the United States. It was licensed in 2007 and replaced the previously used smallpox vaccine, Drivax, which as Dr. Harrison mentioned, is no longer available. This vaccine, ACAM2000, has been used in laboratory and healthcare workers as well as select Department of Defense personnel. The vaccine itself is a live vaccinia virus that is produced in varicell cells using modern manufacturing methods. The vaccine is derived, it's a clonal de derivative of Drivax, uh, a New York City Board of Health strain that was used during the eradication campaign of smallpox and ACAM2000 is expected to share many of the properties of this virus. The vaccine is administered in a single dose percutaneously via multiple puncture with a bifurcated needle, which is uh, pictured here. Following vaccine administration, uh, a lesion develops at the site of vaccination, uh, the progression of which is depicted in these pictures. Uh, during this time, the lesion does contain infectious virus that can be trans transmitted to others via inadvertent inoculation or to other sites of the body uh, via auto-inoculation. However, this cutaneous response is also referred to as a take and is considered a marker of successful vaccination. Historically, smallpox vaccines have been associated with a number of adverse events, some of which can be severe and life-threatening. Some of those include eczema vaccinatum, progressive vaccinia, and post-vaccinial encephalitis. Uh, this table presents the rate of adverse events from primary vaccination with Drivax. Um, it presents, this data was produced from a study that uh, was performed in 1968 during the time of routine immunization with smallpox vaccine. Of note, the uh, rates are described as cases per million vaccinations, and the rates range for serious adverse events in, of progressive vaccinia, eczema vaccinatum, and post vaccinal encephalitis from 1.5 to 38.5 uh, cases per million vaccination. 
overall rates for uh, death were also reported as approximately one death per million vaccination. Uh, this table is resulting from the same study, but giving the rates for revaccination. And clearly the rates for revaccination are much lower than those for primary vaccination. Uh, in reviewing data from a more recent study, uh, evaluating the adverse event rates observed during the Department of Defense and Department of Health and Human Services vaccination programs uh, during 2002 and 2005, uh, give us these rates uh, illustrated in this table. Uh, one first point of note is the absence of any observed eczema vaccinatum or progressive vaccinia cases. And this is likely due to the uh, intense screening um, of persons for risk factors for these adverse events. A uh, second point of note is the uh, incidence of myopericarditis, which should not previously been recognized as a significant adverse event uh, related to smallpox vaccine. Uh, using this background, we have used the uh, grading and recommendations assessment development and evaluation method to assess the use of ACAMP 2000 in lab workers uh, outlined as, as outlined in the following steps. Uh, first, starting with developing a policy question, identifying and assessing the importance of outcomes, uh, performing a literature review, summarizing the evidence for critical outcomes, and lastly, evaluating quality of evidence for outcomes. The policy question formulated by the working group was, should administration of ACAM 2000 be recommended routinely to persons at risk for orthopox viral disease? The population of interest is persons at risk for exposure to orthopox viruses, that being primarily uh, our laboratory workers and healthcare workers. The intervention is vaccination with ACAMP 2000, the currently available vaccine, and the comparison is vaccination with Drivax, the previously recommended vaccine. We used a modified Delphi method to solicit outcomes assessments from our working group members. The outcomes identified included benefits and harms outcomes. Among the benefits were vaccine efficacy to prevent orthopox viral disease, cutaneous response or take, and neutralizing antibody response. Among the harms were serious adverse events, myopericarditis resolved with sequelae, myopericarditis resolved without sequelae, inadvertent inoculation, and mild adverse events. Those outcomes deemed to be critical were vaccine efficacy to prevent orthopox viral disease, as well as serious adverse events, and myopericarditis resolved without, with sequelae. All of the outcomes were included in the evidence profile, though data was not available for vaccine efficacy to prevent orthopox viral disease. Uh, as such, cutaneous response and neutralizing antibody response were used as surrogates for this uh, benefit outcome. We performed a systematic literature review to identify um, studies that uh, met our criteria and uh, address the outcomes identified by the working group. Uh, we identified a total of five randomized controlled trials which uh, addressed the benefits outcomes, and four of these also addressed the uh, harms outcomes. The following slides will give a brief summary of these critical outcomes. The first being the cutaneous response. The cutaneous response was best assessed in two studies evaluating this outcome in both vaccinia naive as well as previously vaccinated subjects who were vaccinated with both ACAM 2000 and the comparator Drivax. You can see that 96% of vaccinia naive subjects uh, did demonstrate vaccination success and ACAM 2000 was found to be um, non-inferior to the comparator Drivax uh, among this population. However, for previously vaccinated subjects, 84% uh, demonstrated vaccination success by cutaneous response as compared to Drivax, which demonstrated 98% of subjects. Um, a st statistical analysis uh, revealed that um, ACAM 2000 did not meet the predefined criteria for non-inferiority to uh, Drivax uh, among this uh, population. When looking at the neutralizing antibody response, uh, these same studies uh, evaluated 
the response in both, again, vaccinia naive subjects as well as previously vaccinated subjects. Um, as you can see among vaccinia naive subjects, the, both the geometric mean neutralizing antibody titer as well as the log 10 mean were comparable to the comparator Drivax, although by the slightest of margins, uh, ACAM 2000 did not meet the criteria for non-inferiority to the comparator vaccine. In contrast, among the previously vaccinated subjects, the neutralizing antibody titers were again similar and in this instance did meet criteria for non-inferiority. In looking at the critical harms outcomes, there were actually no serious adverse events re reported in the randomized control trials that we reviewed, uh, and that include no incidence of death, eczema, vaccinatum, progressive vaccinia, or post-vaccinal encephalitis. With respect to myopericarditis, there were seven cases of suspected myopericarditis reported among the 2,983 clinical trial participants who received ACAM 2000. The best estimate of risk based on uh, detection of five cases among 873 vaccinees during the phase three clinical trials, which incorporated active monitoring for myopericarditis, um, gives a rate of 5.7 cases per 1,000 vaccinees. We also found that one case uh, among these uh, reported myopericarditis uh, did demonstrate um, sequelae, uh, that being persistent abnormal echocardiogram at one year. So we used the GRADE methodology to assess the evidence. Uh, the summary is presented here in this table. Um, throughout, for all the outcomes, we did not find any concerns for risk of bias or inconsistency. However, uh, there were concerns about indirectness in the cutaneous response and neutralizing antibody response, as well as the myopericarditis resolved without sequelae outcomes. Um, with respect to imprecision, there were concerns with regards to the serious adverse events and inadvertent inoculation outcomes, uh, which I'll describe in the following slides. Given these concerns, the evidence type was downgraded for those outcomes, as you can see in the evidence type column. With respect to indirectness, there was concerns that the outcome that was assessed in the randomized cl clinical trials may have been different from that of the primary interest. Uh, with respect to the benefits outcomes, uh, the cutaneous response and neutralizing antibody response were again surrogates for the outcome of primary interest, that being vaccine efficacy to prevent orthopox viral disease. With respect to uh, myopericarditis, the real clinical significance of myopericarditis that resolves without sequelae is unclear. And actually many of these cases represented asymptomatic disease that were only detected due to the intensive cardiac monitoring that was uh, performed during these trials. And these included uh, monitoring of EKGs as well as cardiac enzymes. Some of the suspected cases were really only transient EKG changes or elevations of cardiac enzymes uh, that had no symptoms whatsoever. So based on this, uh, it was concluded that myopericarditis resolved with sequelae uh, would be the primary outcome of interest. In terms of imprecision, uh, we found that the clinical trials were not adequately powered to detect serious adverse events, that being, again, eczema vaccinatum, progressive vaccinia, post-vaccinal post encephalitis, and death. Uh, and it was also not powered to uh, detect uh, inadvertent inoculation. The calculations below just illustrate the probability that you wouldn't see these adverse events based on the number of participants in the clinical trials as well as the sample size that you would need to detect these events. And uh, these calculations certainly support uh, the assessment of imprecision um, in these cases. So based on this grade assessment, the overall level of evidence was determined to be a two uh, as the studies evaluated were all randomized control trials, though they did have important limitations. So in terms of next steps, uh, the work group uh, will begin updating and revising the recommendations using the data that we've uh, reviewed and discussed to date. Um, our 
hope is to present these recommendations uh, to the ACIP at a future uh, meeting and ultimately, as indicated by Dr. Harrison, to publish these recommendations in an ACIP policy note. So I'll conclude by again thanking our working group members who have been uh, very uh, enthusiastic and uh, contributed uh, greatly. And so uh, with that, I will open it up to questions. I, I have one quick question. Is more uh, in terms of nomenclature, uh, should we not be referring this to this as an orthopox virus vaccine as opposed to smallpox vaccine? I'm just curious about that. Um, and it's more kind of a, a thought question. Uh, Dr. Kemp, you had a... Yes, uh, on slide 24, when you're talking about the serious sequelae, I'm, maybe I missed it, but that looks like you're just reporting on, you're not giving the comparator for dry vats. Is that right? So what would be, what, what were the harms, um, since you're comparing these two, products, right? Sure. What, what were the harms for dry vax? In terms of myopericarditis, uh, the rate of um, myopericarditis in the dry vax uh, was, um, was lower. Um, I can provide that information to you. I can tell you that there were seven cases uh, reported among the ACAM 2000 group, and there were three cases reported among the uh, dry vax group. Um, the denominator data, I don't have off the top of my head. Um, but I can get that for you. Yes. Uh, Dr. Campos had a cold. Yep. Um, so, so that's a pretty high rate of myocarditis. Um, Correct. We're looking at about one per 180 or something like that. So it's just a rough calculation. So what I would be interested in seeing is what is, what's the rate of auto inoculation and other complications from laboratory workers who are who get exposures because <clears throat> I think what we have to weigh is the benefits harms and benefits of offering it to somebody I mean that's a rate of one out of 180 I, I'd like to compare that to the comp to the rates of auto inoculation and other complications from from a, in a you know getting the vaccine expo or the vaccine exposure in the lab sure uh, we could certainly investigate that and and see if we can determine the rate of uh, auto inoculation among laboratory workers with lab-acquired infections. That can be done. Uh, Dr. Kemp? I guess, I guess my original question kind of goes to that point. Why are you not compare, doing the grade against nothing versus the drybacks? Or is that the more appropriate thing to do? The previously recommended vaccine was Dryvax. Um, and so that is how we've approached uh, our grade assessment. Um, if we were to go back and try to do a comparison with nothing, there is no randomized clinical trials and there is actually very little data um, to, to evaluate that question. Um, it's really, since smallpox vaccine was the first vaccine invented and it's really in some sense has been grandfathered in, there hasn't been robust studies to uh, evaluate its actual efficacy um, against uh, orthopox viruses. Dr. Herman. If I remember correctly, in the 2003 pre-event Drivax vaccination program, the people who got myocarditis were older, I think, and um, often male. Um, is there any indication that there are certain types of people who are more likely to get myocarditis in this group? Um, you would be correct that you know, the persons who experienced myopericarditis in the recent vaccination campaigns were older, although overall uh, the population being vaccinated was older as well. And so in analyses of myopericarditis, uh, there haven't really been any significant uh, risk factors that have been identified um, among the population that might predict who would be at higher risk of uh, suffering this adverse event. Dr. Decker. Yeah, Michael Decker, Sanofi Pasteur. I think I might be able to offer some insight on most of the questions that I asked so far by telling you briefly about one of the post-marketing trials that we're conducting as the license holder for uh, uh, ACAM 2000 vaccine. When it was licensed uh, um, as, as a national imperative at the time, that was licensed uh, in recognition of the data that, that Dr. Peterson has described and, and uh, in in association with a family of coordinated post-marketing commitment trials designed to further assess the safety. 
all of which, or all but one of which, are still underway. One's been completed, uh, and the report's in preparation. Now, one of these trials, which I'll call by the name we use for it, the 004 study, is, uh, I'm sorry, all the studies are conducted within the Department of Defense, because that's where you find people getting this vaccine. And one of these studies, the 004 study, is conducted among troops deploying, being deployed to overseas, who are being processed for deployment, receiving the ACAM 2000 vaccine. Uh, we have study sites at six major uh, military bases in the United States uh, that solicit participation of deploying troops into the study. And we solicited about 130,000 deploying troops in the study. We've gotten about 10% of them to participate. Um, actually, more than that, about 15,000 participate. Of those, about uh, oh, approximately 12,000 received ACAM, and the rest did not receive ACAM, either because they did not need another smallpox vaccination or because they had a, uh, uh, a something like a family contraindication. In other words, a pregnant, a close contact who's pregnant is a contraindication to receive the vaccine. Now, this study population obviously differs from the study population of laboratorians in that these are generally more fit people and they're receiving their vaccinations in a, in a highly structured and organized DOD program that, that uh, has a rigorous list of contraindications. That list of contraindications is in and of itself a list of things that put you at higher risk of complications if you receive the vaccination. So yes, there are clearly things that put you at higher risk. For example, anybody with, with more than four signal cardiac or cardiorespiratory conditions is not offered vaccination. Um, CDC also operates, I think, off of a similar list in giving guidance to who's vaccinated through the civilian program, uh, but I, I'm not gonna try to speak for CDC. So of the, the study is still underway, therefore I don't have the, the detailed results, but from our administrative management of the study, I can tell you that approximately three per, per thousand vaccinees develop signs or symptoms suggestive of possible myopericarditis that warrants their referral to an independent expert committee that adjudicates based on the complete available medical data whether or not they have uh, definite, probable, possible, or no myopericarditis. So based on that, about, about uh, 30 so far out of the 10,500 and some odd have been adjudicated as possible, probable, or definite myopericarditis. That's typically based on elevated troponin or abnormal EKG. Virtually none of these people have been symptomatic. Um, there's also an attempt to follow the long-term clinical course, as you just heard, and almost no one solicited is willing to participate in that study, which perhaps suggests that they don't feel any personal benefit of having a study because they don't feel any personal medical problems. But that's just conjecture. Great, thank you for that thank additional you. information, Dr. Decker. Uh, any other uh, questions, discussion? Okay, uh, I, I do not believe that we have any public comment signed up, so uh, if there any, is anyone who wants to get a last comment in, this is the time, otherwise we will close the meeting and wish you happy travels. Thank you.